book entitled 40 Years of Permanent Revolution in English Language Teaching, A Personal Perspective. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Roy Cross. They know how to make you feel slightly nervous, don't they, standing on the stage while you're waiting. Can you hear me at the back? Yes, good, good. Let me say thank you very much to Tai Tisol for, for inviting me. Um, this is going to be kind of rushed. I've got too many slides, but I hope some of them are interesting and I've set my timer. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty much exactly 40 years since I started working for the British Council at Zagreb University, which was then Yugoslavia. It's now a different independent country. Plus a change? Maybe, maybe, we'll see, we'll see. Now then, just to make sure you're all awake, tell your neighbour if you can, I hope you can see these guys from the back, they're pretty big. Tell your neighbour please who these six people are. There will be one that you may be not so sure about, but there's a clue. Has everybody got all six? Do you know who the lady in the top left-hand corner is? Yeah, he says. Shall I very quickly tell you? Starting in the top left-hand corner, the clue is in the logo, Coco Chanel. An old lady who's about the same age as me is next round, that's Madonna. Mother Teresa, a man with a beard who looks a bit like Charles Darwin, but is really Leo Tolstoy. Ah. Coming on round, we all got this one, Mahatma Gandhi. And above Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. Don't relax just yet. I now need you to tell me who said which if that's the right kind of way to put it. Who said which? Who said what? I guess one of them is pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. I chose these quotes for a purpose, however. Um, I chose them because We have to mention Brexit if we're British. Um, but the, the main point is that all of those people, it's about individuals getting personally engaged and active. Yeah? Change belongs here with me. You can use change yourself, no matter who you are. Coco was a bit different. Be the change you wish to see. I can. And I'll come back to that a bit later on. Does anybody recognize that from a great distance? That is the first edition of A.S. Hornby's Learner's Dictionary of Current English. And I'm partly here because I'm working with Hornby Trust colleagues and a group of people from Teachers Associations of ASEAN on a workshop next week. But A.S. Hornby, early in his life, made a lot of money, and to his family's slight surprise, 
gave half of that money away in perpetuity to the A.S. Hornby Educational Trust. And it's since worked with English teachers around the world. I'm not sure what his family think, but they're probably grateful. Yeah? That's, that was, when was that? When was that first edition? If you've got very good eyesight, you might be able to see. But if your eyesight's like mine, you can't quite. 48. Before I was born. And this is from a British Council publication from our archives. Um, it's the tone that's most sort of... The British Council's linguistics panel prepared about a year ago a memorandum on university training and research in the teaching of English as a second language. We sent it to the Committee of Vice Chancellors and Principals, who amongst other things asked the British Council to organise a conference, and this is the result. The production of more people suitably qualified to do the jobs that we want them to do in the English teaching field overseas. Distinguished body of academic people. It's not normally the council's business to set itself up as an expert in anything. I'd like to think we might be expert occasionally, but he says perhaps in the teaching of English. Practitioners. When was this written? It's obviously in the early days of what we now call ELT. 70s. Bit of a clue, there's the contents. It's full of professors and doctors. Yeah. People that worked in the classroom didn't have much credibility. You had to be a professor or a doctor, it was 61. So possibly slightly earlier than some of us were, were thinking. You may have a little a view and teach 12 films, a revolutionary new technology for teachers of English as it's still a second language. And you can teach patterns, you can do oral practice, questions, answers, picture sets. I'm not quite sure what conversation with the blackboard was. Uh, talk to the hand, talk to the blackboard. Yeah? When was that? Give me a guess. I've made this easy because I'm sort of going chronologically. So it's later than 61. 71. 64. 64. This, does anybody, anybody old enough to recognise or indeed to have ever used this Oxford University Press book? It was the first course book I used as a teacher at the studio school in Cambridge way back when, way back when, in the, in the 70s. It had a character called Arthur who always got into trouble. It was helpful for the language in the book that he got into trouble because he had to get out of it. Does anybody recognize that? Not even Caroline Moore, no? That, that was the book I started with. And that was published first in 74. Aha, uh -huh. the first mention of communication, communication games. And back in those days, the British Council had an English language teaching institute. Um, which did quite a lot of research and innovative work. Some of these activities are still used a huge amount today. Find the difference, describe and contrast, ask the right question. It's the beginnings of those communicative language teaching tasks that I think a lot of us have used a whole lot of the time. In. When was this? When did we start to think about the communication thing? Seventy-nine. Seventy-nine. Another exciting new technology. But we're still talking, as you can see there, the second one by Dave Willis, the potential and limitations of video. 
101 ways to use video by Dave's wife, Jane. Video in English for specific purposes, Chris Kennedy. When was this? 83. This is an interesting one. The title is not immediately clear. It's actually talking about how English as a foreign language or a second language relates to English as mother tongue communication studies work. And it was the first attempt to sort of explore what can they learn from each other. Two halves of a single profession, current concerns of shared interest in communication studies and ESP. Back then, I think we were a whole lot more concerned, I was tempted to say, obsessed with ESP. We thought that ESP was a very scientific activity. And we, we developed all sorts of very specific courses for different specific purposes. Approaches, standards, research, Newcastle Polytechnics Writing Centre. Collaborative teaching. Communication skills, going to mention. Testing, communication studies, that was 84, 84. Now, I'd like you to look very carefully at that title in terms of singular and plural nouns. What have you got? One language, right? One language. But we're prepared to admit that there might be more than one literature. Two very eminent editors, Randolph Quirk and Henry Widdison. And Randolph does a piece on the English language in a global context. But if you look at the way he frames that, it's the English language in a global context. English literature, information. At the bottom, if you can just see it, a very interesting title to a piece by Chris Candlin, who got a mention yesterday. Um, Teacher-centered training, costing the process, which implies that there is an additional cost to this. But looking at it from today's perspective, what other kind of training would you ever wish to do, apart from teacher-centred training? I guess you could do trainer-centred training, but I'm not sure it would be as useful. But back then, Chris was exploring something that was a little unusual. Learner-centred methodology. 84. First mention of individualization and autonomy. Remember learner autonomy? I think we take it for granted now, do we? Um, this was a, a rather more academic publication. The ethnography of autonomy. Autonomy and individualization in language learning institutional implications by Jenny Pugsley. Syllabus negotiation, the basis of learner autonomy. Okay, I did yeah. my MA in Applied Linguistics at Lancaster, 84-85, uh, and among the people teaching on that course at the time were Chris Candlin and a guy called Michael Breen. And Mike took the whole of the MA course, we were 25 of us, and he effectively locked us in a room for a week with no instructions at all really and sort of said, right, just get on with it. And we said, well, get on with what? Never mind that, he said, just get on with it. Uh, it was a painful and pretty useful experience eventually. We spent a fair bit of time to start with, well, what were we, what we, we negotiating? What was this? We hadn't got a curriculum. He hadn't told us what to do. How did we spend this week together? We, we got there in the end. One for Martha there, the individualization of pronunciation improvement. That sounds kind of specific. 88, 
88. Now then, I have the pen in my pocket. I have carried it with me since 1990 when I was unable to return to Iraq. Um, had a wonderful year, but it was a very badly timed year. It ended with the first Gulf War, and I couldn't go back. My family couldn't go back. And these pens that we had had made ready for the first, we thought, Pan-Arab Teacher Development Conference in Basra in October of 1990, they never got used. And there are 999 other pens somewhere in Iraq, but one of them is with me. Culture. Culture in the language classroom. Michael Byron got a mention yesterday too from Farhad. Um, starting to look at this culture thing, I, I, I just attended Albert Jew's talk on culture and things in classes in Japan at Japan universities. And this was beginning to, this was actually quite unusual when they did it. The cultural context of foreign language learning in Great Britain. English language and culture in Soviet textbooks was a, an interesting one. If you know anything about Soviet textbooks, they told you that the whole of Britain went to public school and most of us went to Eton. That there was only one good newspaper. It was the Morning Star. Um, it was a their view of Britain was, was a very, very specific Soviet view. That was 1990. Something quite close to my own heart is there may be one or two of you that know what LTEX is. It's the English Language Teaching Contact Scheme. And you can sort of see from that map, it, it was developed when the, the Soviet Union collapsed and a whole lot of countries in East and Central Europe were allowed to engage more fully with, with Western Europe and to consider learning other languages apart from Russian. And most of them chose English. But this for, for me and many of my generation was a very instructive experience. Um, we asked the British government for what we thought was a huge sum of money, a preposterously large sum of money that we wouldn't possibly get to work with East and Central Europe. We asked, it seems a bit funny today, for five million pounds, which isn't a whole lot of money nowadays in government terms, but to our astonishment, they gave us all the five million pounds and then we had to very quickly work out how on earth we were going to spend it. And a number of us made a number of visits to Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Poland, to explore what it was that we might most usefully do. And the most valuable thing about, I, I have to admit, and I think most of my colleagues would admit, I made a trip to Romania and I was expecting to meet a bunch of people who didn't know very much, who didn't speak very good English, who quite frankly were a bit backward compared to me. I arrived in Bucharest, this would have been the autumn of 1990, and they'd arranged for me to meet a group of 50, 60 English teachers and inspectors. I walked into the room and they all spoke English better than me. And I had a little moment of epiphany. Aha, uh -huh, I thought, well, maybe these guys are not too bad at this English learning thing. Let, let's correct some of our prejudices and preconceptions. In Romania, it turns out, it was an act of defiance. You were not allowed to listen to the BBC but you did. You were not really allowed to learn English from listening to the BBC, but you did. 
and as a result there was motivation to become incredibly proficient speakers and teachers of English. And the thing I take from this is that hold back, let's start from where the people you're working with find themselves. A bit too small to read, but it, it's sort of British studies, European language, etc. 95 that was, the middle of the 90s. And I think if you've got reasonable eyesight, you can see the date on this one. But the title again is kind of interesting, isn't it? If we go back to that 1961 piece, the British Council's Royal Charter told the British Council to spread English, further English around the world. We're still talking in 95, slightly surprisingly, about spreading English. We still feel either we have to, we're probably fairly sure it's a good thing, we're spreading English. Namibia, China, Thailand, Malta, and I'm going to come back to something that some of you may remember called Pisset. Who remembers Pisset? Anybody? Whoa! One person, Suchada, well done. But only, you must do two, yeah, yeah two, two. Um, I'll come back to that because that was almost exactly 30 years ago. And 95, the book was 95, the project was, was, was 88, and he said the project for the improvement of secondary English teaching was a joint project between the Thai Ministry of Education and the British government. It provided a model, a model of sustainable achievement in improving the efficiency and effectiveness with which English was taught and learned in state secondary schools throughout Thailand. So since 1988, you Thai people, you've had no problems whatsoever, right? Sorted. We finished this back in 1988. This was the objective that they set themselves 30 years ago. Quality teaching. 12,000 teachers at that time in 1,800 state secondary schools. To meet the needs of the country for a large number of young people with communicative English language ability. And Ian Stewart, who again, one or two of you will remember, who worked for the council in Bangkok, his evaluation was pretty positive. They did everything. Some of you will remember Eric's. Eric's still survive, yeah? But if one is being a little cynical, this was all done back in 1980. Back then, clearly, clearly impossible to give all 12,000 teachers a refresher course in English. But if we've done nothing else in the last 30 years, we've improved our capacity. So the project that's just ended, this is the boot camp, yeah? There was a session yesterday and people said, what's this boot camp thing? It's a punishment. Um, it, it, was, it was the name that was used. It's known as the Regional English Training Centre Project. But actually, that engaged with 17,000 teachers, 230 regional supervisors, 60 teachers mentored, 30 master trainers, 15 centres. 30 years later, apparently, we needed to do it all over again because that sustainable achievement from 1988 wasn't so sustainable perhaps. And I'm just going to look quickly at two or three bits of evaluation of the, the boot camp. Um, basically they say this in many ways is very good but What's going to happen now? How do we sustain this? 
And the key thing for me, it's going back perhaps to those quotations from Madonna and Nelson Mandela, it's the individual. It's the individual who has to take responsibility. So David Hayes did an evaluation of the boot camp, and I, I put in bold for change to become deep-seated, a part of everyday teaching practice, teachers must be given opportunities to continue to develop their understanding of the innovations introduced on the courses in their own classrooms in collaboration with colleagues. And the PLCs may be part of the solution. David also remarks, if the RETC, the boot camp training, is seen as an end point, and if the sound foundation it's provided is not built on, boom, 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 will not be sustained. Uh, Steve Mann and Adam Edmet were looking at a particular experiment within the boot camp, which was the use of iPads with Iris Connect for remote observation of teaching. It was a, a methodology that enabled Thai teachers to record their own classes, to upload the film, and to review it and analyze their classroom practice with colleagues and tutors. And again, they say Thai teachers are busy. All teachers are busy. There's a lack of time for this kind of innovation. But maybe these PLC things are going to provide an opportunity for people to reflect on their practice. And what you call a PLC here in Thailand, the, the council in at least two countries, in India and in Egypt, calls a TAG, a teacher action, or in some cases a teacher activity group. And if we're lucky, we now get a little cartoon from the Indian project. Couple of minutes. Good morning, Miss Asha. Is something troubling you? I see. You want to make your class more engaging for your students? And you want your students to have fun while they learn? I have just the solution for you. Come with me. If you're wondering where all these teachers are going, then here we are. Welcome to our teacher activity group. A teacher activity group, or TAG, is a place for teachers to discuss and learn. Teachers from the same locality meet once a month, share ideas, challenges, and make action plans to transform their own teaching to make it more effective for their students. With the help of resources from the British Council and other materials, you can choose what topics you want to cover in your TAG meeting and create your own learning pathway. You can practice your English. Oh, these are more cheaper. Yes, but just cheaper, not more cheaper. <laughs> Learn new techniques to make your lessons more engaging. Practice fun and interactive activities and watch interesting videos of teachers showing how to do activities in classrooms. All this to help you improve your skills and make your teaching more effective and more fun. You can learn in pairs or as a group. It's all up to you. A teacher from your group is selected to be a teacher facilitator who will keep the group focused on tasks by managing group discussions and keeping time. At the end of every session, you complete the reflection and action planning sheet to record your learning and help you implement it. And there are hundreds of tags, so you can exchange ideas with other teachers on WhatsApp and Facebook. In short, you and your community of teachers can now take charge of your own development. Now isn't that something? So students, did you have fun while learning today?
very similar to my understanding of your PLCs, perhaps with a little more structure, with in a sense a, a sort of course book, a resource book, which people can use to get themselves started. There's some ideas. It's difficult to sit down as a group, I think, and immediately come up with ideas that are going to be of, of, of value. Um, and last year, Naraporn Chanocha, I think she gave a plenary talk here, and she was talking about PLCs. And teachers must get rid of the idea that they take part in professional development only because they're told to. This goes back to those quotations, it's me, it's you, engage. Take responsibility for your development. And Naraporn also gave me the opportunity to use a poem by Philip Larkin that I try to shoehorn into every presentation because I love it. She, she talks about no more isolated teacher. Teachers must stop believing their classroom is a sacred place. Um, over the years, I've often said to audiences of teachers, when did you last visit your neighbor's classroom? And the answer is usually either never or once about three years ago. Very rarely do you get people, oh, yes, I was in there last week and I'm going in there tomorrow. We keep our classrooms very separate. And Larkin, um, just about my favorite poet, had a poem about this. Um, the importance of elsewhere. I used to give a talk on the importance of elsewhere. And in this context, elsewhere can be the next door classroom. Little bit of background, Larkin was very English, remained very English to the end of his days. But for a period of his career, he worked in Belfast. And Belfast, as you all know, is not English. It's Irish, it's Northern Irish. And he found it a huge positive shock. The importance of elsewhere. Lonely in Ireland, since it was not home, strangeness made sense. The salt rebuff of speech, insisting so on difference, made me welcome. Once that was recognized, we were in touch. Their drafty streets end on to hills, the faint archaic smell of dockland like a stable. The herring hawkers cry, dwindling, went to prove me separate, not unworkable. Living in England has no such excuse. These are my customs and establishments. It would be much more serious to refuse. Here, no elsewhere underwrites my existence. And to be a bit unkind to Larkin, I would like all teachers to have an elsewhere to underwrite their existence. A sense of other people's teaching practice, how other people do things. And if I have enough time, which I do, I'll continue. Um, we, we had a series of Dunford House seminars every year for 15 years. Um, and I think it's fair, the title of the book is a little bit presumptuous, The Development of English Language Teaching, but it certainly captured a lot of what happened over that fairly important period. Jerry Abbott, Mike Beaumont. Communicative comes up again. Methodology. I'll come back to that one I've marked in yellow. They are a set of questions identified in 1982. Problems, or if you like, I've forgotten the word, um, issues to do with teacher training in 1982, right? How many years ago is that? It's 36, seven years. I'm not here, Suchada, sorry. No. Um, we'll come back to those. Covers pretty much the whole of the territory. And these are those problems. And I'm just going to let you, there's, there's 
it's about 20 of these problems and it seems to me that we still face these problems or most of them 30 years on which is probably not a bad thing it just means that those guys 30 years ago got it got it right what procedures can be adopted for helping students on a basic teacher training course whose own level of English is only at the book they are teaching. How could you encourage community of language teaching among untrained but experienced teachers who have large classes, few resources, little material incentive to change, and who know they are being preached to by experts who have done little or no teaching in their circumstances? Years ago, I, I don't really know why, I can't remember, I was giving a lecture in India on teaching large classes, which to be frank is not something I know a whole lot about. And I'd been talking for about two minutes and they started to laugh. I noticed a, a sort of giggle running around the audience and I stopped and said, well, what's the joke? And they said, well, we get the impression that you think a large class is about 35. I said, well, yeah, well, they said, here, a large class is somewhere between 150 and 200. It's probably taught in the same classroom, everybody together. Ah, I said, right, um, what am I going to talk about for the next 40 minutes, you know, but... Uh, um, how can the trainee be encouraged to relinquish classroom authority? Um, that remains very much with us. Uh, until you've got the confidence to let go, the one thing you don't want to do is let go of your class because you'll lose, you'll lose control. I like the second one here. This was clearly heartfelt. Does a well-paid foreigner have the right, the moral right, I suggest, to harass very badly paid colleagues with giving up what they've been doing for years and putting in vast amounts of extra time in order to make life more complicated for students whose school leaving grades were good enough only for them to become chronically badly paid school teachers. In the context of the boot camp, how does one make the most effective use of individual observation and guidance visits to the classes of teachers already in service? And the one I marked in red is the one that we've been looking at with PLCs and tags, how can we ensure that ideas and techniques which are discussed and practiced in teacher training sessions are actually adopted and adapted by teachers on a long-term basis? And to make the point again, it's not us that can do that, it's me, I, you. How do you convince teachers that some form of innovation is possible in the classroom when circumstances prevent your being able to demonstrate its practicality with a class of students equal in number to the size of the class that the teacher is likely to have to contend with in schools, perhaps up to 60, 70 students? And way back when, when I started doing teacher training and development work, the major challenge was that people in Zagreb would say, but that's all right, you can do that. I can't, yeah, and I think the usual reason was to do with me being a native speaker, despite the fact I had minimal experience, I somehow had that sort of magic ability, you can do it, I can't. That was, that book was published in 97, but those questions came from 1982, and just for a bit of a joke at the end, the internet, ha, oh! and ELT, David Eastman's book, yeah, Hmm? I know you were involved, yes. <laughs> um, and I love the, where are we? Halfway through that first paragraph, the internet and ELT, they say, there is a great deal of hype about the new technology. Let's not get carried away with this internet thing. Yeah? And that was what they were thinking in 1999. 20 years on, I think we have got carried away. Last example, 
Who is a nest and who is a let? Put your hands up if you're a nest. Some people who are nests are not putting up their hands, but uh, maybe it's a less well-known term than I... Uh, it's become quite a sort of well-understood. Local, local English teacher, native speaker English teacher. Uh, this is an area that Peter Medjesh first sort of addressed. Um, and that whole relationship between the import, the foreigner, who may not know very much at all about Japan, and the local colleagues. And that was more recent, 2016. 2016. All of those publications are, are available on the Council's website, um, and they can be downloaded for free. It's, we have a section called Milestones in ELT from where I took most of those. And if you're interested, it, it gives you a, an overview of the, the way the profession has developed these last 50 years. You know. um, but to end with, a little bit of Thai wisdom on change. I'm told this is a Thai proverb. Can anybody confirm that? Do you recognize it, Thai people? Yes? That's Thai. This is, this is change in Thailand. At high tide, fish eat ants. At low tide, ants eat fish. So never mind all that British Council rubbish. Thailand had it worked out some time ago. Thank you very much. That's my email address. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Roy Cross, for an interesting presentation. And now may I call upon Dr. Panita Nitayapon, the President of Thailand TSO, to present a token of appreciation to our Filipino speaker.